Uh, good evening from Dubai. Good morning in Jamaica. Good morning, Sean, and good evening, yes. Uh, so wonderful to see and hear you, um, virtually though, but we're still together, apart, but together. Apart, but together. So, Minister Bartlett, you're one of the longest serving tourism ministers that's so done amazing things for our industry, also as chairperson of a, of a Tourism Resilience Council. But I want to start by asking you on the topic of today, tourism and biodiversity. How this relationship plays out in, in Jamaica and the Caribbean and small island states more generally? Uh, beyond serving as part of the tourism product, of course, biodiversity is a significant contributor to the attractiveness and quality of our product, and by extension, our competitiveness in the global tourism market. So Jamaica's terrestrial biodiversity is characterized by over 3,304 vascular plant species, approximately 600 species of ferns, 136 species of butterflies, and 106 known bird species that are endemic to the island. Our Jamaica's coastline is approximately 1,022 kilometers and includes an array of ecosystems, including coral reefs, seagrass, beds, mangrove forests, wetlands, and so on. So in the Caribbean then overall, a coral reef generates uh, for, for us tourism an approximately 4.7 billion US dollars um, and some 2.1 billion US in net revenue in 2000. Um, the, these are the last calculated figures that we have. So communities then benefit um, from the increased economic activity in these areas and the social good of sharing their traditions and culture with visitors in an authentic way. It has been one of my priorities to ensure a higher tourist dollar retention rate for the country. And particularly for these communities, the, the ones that are within our coastal areas and also within the, the biodiversity spread that embraces our mountains and rivers and valleys and so on. So many of the residents work in the ecosystem ventures and they benefit from investment by tourism partners in community infrastructure and upkeep. And some contemplate uh, entrepreneurship also in micro, small and medium tourism enterprise uh, in these niche areas. And these are very important to us. And I actually make provisions for it by way of funding support to build capacity and to enable uh, the small partners in these areas to utilize the richness of our biodiversity as an income generating um, activity. So the slowdown of tourism due to COVID-19 pandemic must have had a dramatic impact on communities, but also on your conservation budget. How do you, how do you look off the national parks and protected areas in the absence of a tourism revenue? Yeah, good question. As a, as a state party, as we are to the Convention on Biodiversity, uh, Jamaica remains committed um, to biodiversity conservation. And we recently submitted our sixth national report under the convention. So the efforts then to ensure environmental sustainability, although resting mainly within another ministry portfolio, I take a deep interest in because uh, tourism, as you know, depends so strongly on the ecosystem services. So the master plan for our own sustainable tourism development, which, which I chair, um, and the National Strategy Action Plan on, bio, on biological diversity and relevant legislative guides are part of the operational guidelines that we try to develop and follow. Uh, so we have legislative arrangements. We actually establish our own um, natural resource conservation authority, our wildlife protection um, and beach control acts that have enabled us to do some level of monitoring and provide some regulatory framework to ensure that our um, philosophies in relation to, to the greening of the tourism sector is maintained and, and is complied with. So the travel and tourism sector, as you know, yes, we are reeling from COVID-19. And one of the hardest hit sectors in the world 
as you know, is, is out. So the loss of jobs and livelihood, the contraction in the economy, um, strains on public health services that we have. And already, as you know, small uh, countries like ours do feel that pain because our own capacity to manage the health demand that the pandemic has brought is significantly um, minimal. So we, we have been working nonetheless with um, the health partners and um, the international organizations that support health, like the WHO and PAHO. Um, and, and, and we in the Caribbean have developed our own um, uh, mechanism uh, through um, the collaboration between all the states within our CARICOM area. So, so yes, we've seen losses. Um, and yes, we have um, seen significant reduction in economic activity. But what I want to say in all of this is that there is a sense of commitment to see ourselves through this. And I know you're gonna ask me about resilience later on, but the Caribbean has to come out of this stronger and better. And we are relying heavily on the richness of old biodiversity and the blue economy to a large mm -hmm. extent, because this is part you know, of, of our treasure trove of assets that we have to pull on to get out of this crisis over time. So, so, so I say that, yes, um, the region has lost perhaps 30, 40 billion uh, dollars in different areas and job losses have been over 2 million in the process. But, and it's not only confined to tourism as you know, right? But we are strong, we remain resilient and determined to get out of this one together. So, so let me ask you, Ben, with that experience, that, that focus on resilience, uh, in your global capacity as, as, as a leader of the Tourism Resilience Council, how has your thinking changed in, in the face of COVID-19 about the relationship between, between tourism and nature and nature and people? Well, you know, Sean, the, the vision and the mission are now intertwined. Um, when we had the vision first, it seemed the mission would never really be congealed and we wouldn't get even support for the mission. Well, COVID has brought everybody into a recognition that the mission is ours. And, um, and so resilience has now not become just a word in, in the Caribbean and in Jamaica. It has now become a way of life you know, for us to survive and hopefully thrive. So, so we're seeing a delicate balance between nature, tourism, and the people. And, and that's been a challenge because, you know, we keep talking about how do we build the balance between lives and livelihood. And um, for us, tourism is part of the challenge that COVID brings. Uh, but because we are so integral to the economy of the region, we are part of the solution and hope that the economy has. And so in, in, in an interesting way, there is that dichotomy and there's that ambivalence too on the part of our own people as to how we relate mm -hmm. you know, to tourism and its recovery efforts. However, resourcing the recovery of tourism is a critical consideration. And although, you know, a clear of the resilience center, one of the things that I have been pushing is to get multilaterals to recognize the importance of building resilience in the communities and human capital development, even in this crisis, to spend more effort on building capacity for people to act better, to act more appropriately and to be the drivers themselves of their own recovery program. And this has been a challenge. Um, and, and so looking down the road, you know, I'm seeing, however, green shoots because the, 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 the dialogue, the discussions have improved over time. 
And even the governments of the region are now beginning to look at, okay, how do we look more closely at uh, building capacity around our people rather than just looking at products and commodities. Yeah. And I think that this is going to be an important um, point of departure in terms of our own ability to recover, recover well and to thrive after. So one thing that has probably changed in this pandemic is also the way that we as tourists and travelers want to relate to destinations. It's about health and safety, but also I think there's a greater demand for authentic experiences and, and for being out in nature. How do you see the consumer of the future? Are we looking at, at I, I think you coined the term Gen C. Yes, I think the, this confluence of demographics that will become a, a single one that will define the new traveler, the generation COVID as we call them, Gen C. And, um, and they, the definition seem to fit how the protocols and the demands have been coming together destination by destination. Also how the suppliers have been operating, what is happening in terms of our travel partners and how they have been requiring more and more of a, a COVID resilient, if not a COVID secure um, facility to enable movement and safe movement. And so the visitor is concerned about health safety and um, he's going to be traveling to destinations where he is uh, comfortable with the uh, protocols that exist there, but more so the compliance within those there. He's also going to be um, changing the way he appears. He's not going to be wearing a mask. He's now going to be sanitizing his you know, activities. He, he's going to be washing his hands every second, if you ask me. He's going to be uh, going through the loop of ensuring that his space is sanitized. Uh, and he's going to be wearing certain type of, of, of clothes as well and he's going to be practicing social distancing. So this is a new type of person that is emerging to enjoy the same wonderful cultural and um, biodiverse uh, assets that are in countries all over the world. But the critical part of it is that we as a destination must recognize this new demographic and to work to enable them to have a greater sense of enjoyment because we could be providing a sterile environment if we're not careful. And tourism is not about being sterile. Tourism is a very happy arrangement that brings people into the best frame of mind possible. Take them into a, a new high, if you will. So we have to make sure that that balance is there. As a destination, Jamaica has also looked at how do we utilize the physical space that we have to ensure that there is COVID compliance in every regard, but there's also opportunities for full enjoyment of the visitor when they come. And so we have established something called a resilience corridor. And that resilience corridor consists of perhaps 85% uh, of the um, tourism assets of Jamaica. But fortunately for us, by dint only of geography, that area has only 1% of the population. So, it allows the opportunity for us to have a, 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 a bubble, if, if you will, and the visitor can be in that bubble, enjoy all the wonderful assets of Jamaica's um, culture and music and art and tourism in general, without doing too much damage to a community spread that may be happening next door. But the other important uh, story I have to say on this one, Sean, is that so far since the 15th of June, since we established this corridor, we have not had one incident of infection by any visitor who comes to the country or the workers of the industry so far. So that's a good story to tell in terms of how this Gen C um, we can be built out and how destinations can ensure that um, the new visitors are safe and secure. Now we go one step further with that. We now establish a insurance end-to-end insurance logistics cover for all visitors who come to the country. So when you come, you, you pay a small uh, you know, fee and for that you get full coverage. If you want to do testing, if you want to do um, 
uh, if you show symptoms and you need medical attention, you get it. Um, and if you get really sick, we can re repatriate you immediately because there will be uh, an air ambulance parked at the airport ready to take you back to your country. Mm -hmm. And importantly, if you're going to the US, you'll be in the John, John Hopkins um, hospitality system. So what we have done is to look as how do you really deal with this new generation, this Gen Z? You want to give them end-to-end -end health security arrangements. Uh, you have to ensure also that they understand their responsibility, which is to make sure they wear the mask, that they have social distance and observe it, that they are uh, practice all the sanita um, sanitizing uh, elements that are available and that they um, stay away from others if they have symptoms. So we, we, we see um, tourism bouncing back because all of this will, will continue, I, I believe, until a, a vaccine is found. And even if a vaccine is not found, I think we have been learning as a, as a, as a world now how to manage this pandemic better. Uh, the result is, of course, that the, the, the expectation that perhaps a third of the world would have been affected already, if not um, and a significant portion of debt has not really happened. So in fairness, I think we as a, as a, as a species have been better able to manage these pandemics and other disruptions that are coming to us. And uh, the, 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 the truth is that the, the better we, 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 we prepare ourselves, is the more we will be able to recover faster and to recover better. And to use the term of the day, stronger. Stronger. Minister Bartlett, thank you so much for, for giving us so much time this morning. Firstly, sharing some wisdom, some advice, good news about best practices and, and preparedness. And, and thank you also for your leadership to the industry in the Global Resilience Council. We really appreciate your time. I think Thank it will be the Sean. first time since 2007 that uh, I went to see you at World Travel Market in London physically. So uh, also thank you for giving us the time virtually. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. And uh, good luck to you and the partners. Um, we have a great job to do. The recovery of the global economy is dependent on tourism and travel. Thank you.